So we've spoken a little bit about different risks and the challenges and some of the statistics, right? And 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 how that kind of all fits together. But how do you as an organization you know, go about, right? Michael, what do we start with? Right? What do I need to focus on, right? I, I don't have the right people. I may not have the right resources. Um, what, what do I do? Well, you know, as with anything, you build a strategy. If, you know, you're in an, in an environment where you're not going to get access to the portal at all, right? Because they don't want to give you even a security reader role. You can pull that information from the API, right? So you can ask the tenant administrators to tell, you know, to give you a service principle that has the ability to read the secure score API. And then you pull in that information and you pull it into a custom dashboard and you can get the same information. Obviously not this tool, not this view, but you can get the, the, the improvement actions, for instance, telling you, okay, these are the improvement actions that you need to go to on these impacted assets for exchange the online. It actually means that it gets specific attributes in the exchange online directory services, depending on the type of license that you assign, which could be an F1, an F3, an E3, an E5 license, or an E1 license in, in Microsoft 365. And that triggers something. It also means that when you make specific changes to an identity in the directory stores, so let's say that you're doing recipient management in Exchange, then it, you're making changes in Exchange Online directory services, and these directory services then um, write so back a look at um, what the MFA result was. Ah, and okay, so they did a mobile app notification to this device. Um, yes, it was me testing with a VPN provider. Now I do remember. Um, so um, what we see here is that there is a potential risky sign in, um, which may or may not lead to a risky user. Uh, when we take a look at the risky user, obviously that risky signed in um, uh, triggered this to be, uh, or triggered my user to be a risky user. But what DVM includes is um, a list of recommendations on all of the devices that have been onboarded into Defender for Endpoint. Um, so looking at that, right, um, you can see block office applications from creating a child processes. That's actually a good one. Um, here, for instance, what it says is um, you can solve this by using attack surface reduction rules. Um, and it also tells you that, first of all, Defender and Diver should be, uh, should be enabled with a primary antivirus solution with real-time protection enabled. And then I should enable this rule in block mode using MAM and group policy. So it will tell you which devices do not have these settings applied correctly. And it also tells me how to I do can that. even right. include custom compliance, which again is an additional check where I run a couple of scripts that says, is this software available? Is that version running? Is that happening on the device? And if all of these checks come back you know, as a yes, 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 then a device is marked as compliant. Now, a compliance state in itself doesn't mean a lot, but I can use that compliance state, as I mentioned last week, into a conditional access policy, where one of the preconditions could be that a device has to be compliant before it is allowed access to the environment. Now, when you take a look at what will cause an impact on Defender or on your endpoint, it's not going to be the EDR component, or it's rarely the EDR component. It's the antivirus that's running on your device. So um, we have supported successfully an organization to roll out 45,000 endpoints with Defender for Endpoint EDR in about three weeks. That's, you know, that's neat. Uh, needless to say, it's much harder to roll out new antivirus to 45,000 endpoints. Teams in and Skype right. and Outlook communication, it means that you can still send emails to that user, provided they're using Office 365, and you can still communicate with that user as well. This is rather important, especially if a user is remote and you want to maintain connectivity to that device. So once you click isolate device, you can specify a reason, click confirm, and normally within a minute or two, that device will shield itself off. That's also rather important, but important to do. Let's say that there is a ransomware attack that has been detected, then you can isolate a device to contain the, um, the spreading of the ransomware throughout the environment. So you can contain patient zero or all the devices that may have a specific you know, uh, vulnerability or you know, ransomware already active on the device so that it doesn't spread across the What is important moving forward is that you make a distinction between Defender uh, Friend Point Antivirus and Defender Friend Point AV. The AV is pre 
breach, right? It protects your device. It detects activities. It detects what's being written to the disk, what's being read from the disk and so forth and so on. And it can intervene in real time. Then there is the EDR component, which reasons over information that it has been labels that I have and how they uh, end up here or better said, how they end up here on top. Okay, so we go to information protection. We've got labels. And as you can see, I've got several labels here. Now, um, in this case, I only got three labels, sorry, four labels uh, defined my tenant. And those labels are pushed to my users through a label policy, right? Obviously I could have several labels, 50 labels, and only have four labels assigned to that user group, four other labels to that user group, six labels to that user group, now, and so forth and so on. The core of creating a new policy in Defender for Cloud Apps is based on the filter that you see here, the activity filter. Uh, or I'm not going to call it the activity filter because the filter which defines the scope of the policy itself. Now, as you can see, there is a lot of elements that you can uh, register or sorry, that you can select here, for instance, we can choose an activity type that says, you know, register resources in Azure, um, add a member to a group, blah, blah, blah. Basically anything for any of the connected applications that you have already connected. To Aside to from the discovery of what's happening in your environment, again, trying to figure out what's happening and who's doing what and what you should potentially do about it. The next step is to actually start using Defender for Cloud Apps to start securing information, sorry, data flows to said applications so and so allows forth. you to uh, configure uh, what they call a risk user risk policy that defines that, you know, uh, whenever users are high in risk, they require a password change. Um, so this will analyze the user risk and combine this with conditional access. So let's go here to conditional access. You can actually you can create a new Microsoft policy. Sentinel the alerts from Defender 365 will actually automatically automatically come in here or um, uh, or not. Right? What you can see here by default is the view of the last 24 hours. But when I go to the last 30 days, what you will see is that the alerts that I showed you in the portal are actually here as well.